Alex here with part 68 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As with my previous videos, I'd like to take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part zero. If you haven't seen it yet, that's the video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are, number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. And that's because my ex's parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is to give my ex one big example of my eight year long high conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. The opposition was met with, um, I guess you could say dismay. It was extremely disheartening for me to see her characterize me as a person who was not communicating with her. Uh, first of all, the way that she characterized it was so disingenuous. It was as if I just enrolled him in school and didn't tell her anything and out of the blue hit her with emotion. Um, none of that is true. There were three different emails that I sent her and even then she was placed on notice about this long ago when we, we uh, you know, signed a stipulation and got it approved by the judge. So even the judge mentioned that this needed to be resolved at a certain point in time. This was far, far from a sneak attack. And yet that's the best argument that she had. So it was at the, now I know that lawyers just do that because that's just what they have to do. If you give a lawyer a bad case, they have to cook something up. They have to find, they're not gonna go and file an opposition saying, yeah, my client's a moron. She didn't respond to any of his emails and now she doesn't have really anything to say except let's get him in a public school for no reason. They don't do that. They have to find some way to spin something and they have to find something to nitpick. I explained this in the video. Um, they will never say good things. And I also talk about it in the video, um, win at all costs. And I'm gonna talk about this again when I actually get into the document, I'm sure, but I do wanna let people know that I do very distinctly remember getting this opposition being very upset because it was way off the course of reality. And we, when we get to the hearing, the judge apparently bought it and was just under this misunderstanding that I just kind of filed a motion without even talking to her. And it, was until, it wasn't until like towards the very end of the hearing that it finally dawned on him that everything that she was saying wasn't true. And I also don't know why he put so much weight into that because he should have been there. We'll talk about this when we actually get to the hearing video. This specific dispute was one of the most frustrating parts of my eight year long high conflict child custody ordeal. And I feel like the judge had this sort of tunnel vision on the fact that I was the one filing papers and the lawyer was exploiting that. I've mentioned earlier in the series and in my other videos that lawyers are keen, uh, keenly aware of what judges want to hear and they tailor their documents, they tailor their arguments to what they think that judge wants to hear. They're in front of a judge over and over again. They figure out what the judge likes, what the judge wants to hear. And so they start to just, copy or mimic that kind of, even if it doesn't apply to the case, they'll find a way to stick it in there because they know that that particular thing is a, is a hot button issue for the judge. So I feel like this lawyer, having been a lawyer for a long time, figured out that this particular judge doesn't like when people file motions. He wants people to just go away. And I explain why this is a problem in the video. End of filings is not end of abuse, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. We need to really just get into what my ex's attorney has filed. Here we have my ex's attorney's opposition to motion to modify timeshare schedule and establish education. She leads off in the first paragraph with a brief summary. She is representing my ex and she's filing an opposition to the motion that I filed to modify the timeshare schedule and choose the school that her son is going to go to. Next page, she leads off with points and authorities. She cites well, she goes into a factual background. The first is a summary, it appears. We have joint physical and legal custody since May 27th. We entered into an agreement stating that we would meet on the third week of May, that the minor child enters kindergarten to discuss and agree upon a modification. 
We also agreed that the modification will be implemented one week before he goes to kindergarten. And she's asking for us to refer to a stipulation and order. I know what she's talking about though, and I think I've already gone over it. Well, for sure, I've gone over the stipulation and order with my viewers. <clears throat> Next paragraph regarding our son's education, an order denying motion and urging participation in parenting classes was filed. The order denied my decision-making powers. Um, I appealed the decision and the Supreme Court affirmed. Okay, so why did she say this? Um, sometimes I wonder if this was my ex because it seems like my ex would push for her attorney to insert something into a court order that shows that my request was denied. But the re here's the thing about putting an order denying into a motion or opposition. If you just put it in for no reason like this, it doesn't necessarily mean that the court should deny this request. In fact, it's not really connected to this request at all. So it makes me wonder why she's bringing this up because I've used orders denying to actually win on the motion that I'm filing. Just because you're showing that the court didn't take action doesn't necessarily mean that the court's going to take that as an indication to not take action again. It could indicate to the court that a, the problem didn't get resolved, so it's time to take action now. Uh, let's see if we get any insight on that further on in the document. <clears throat> now she's saying that I emailed my ex to let her know that I enrolled him into Coral. It was done without any... any <laughs> ah, this is what attorneys do. So she's saying it was done without my ex's input, making it look like I just did something without asking her. This is what they do. I talk about this in the video. They will never see good thing, or say good things. And I also talk about this tactic in the video, win at all costs, where I go into attorneys who employ the tactic of winning at all costs, no matter what you know they, they do or say. So as my viewers have seen in the previous, no, I think it's two videos back, there are three different emails that I sent to my ex. She didn't respond to any of them. So you could see how an attorney does this legal, or um, uh, not legal, uh, lingual gymnastics. They She's saying something that's true, if you take it literally. Yes, I enrolled him in school without any of my ex's input, but the court's not going to read that literally. The court's going to take that as, I just kind of did something just without even mentioning anything to my ex at all. And if the court calls my ex's attorney out on it, hey, why did you lie about saying that no input was received from your client? The lawyer would say, I didn't lie. No input was received from my client. I never said that he didn't message her three times. I talk about this also in the video pretexting. Anyway, this is something that lawyers, and I'm sure I'm going to bring this up on my reply, but um, this is the typical type of stuff that they put into their documents because they want to say something without lying so that they can't be punished, but at the same time mislead the court in a way that whatever it is that they're saying is going to be taken a completely different way. No one's going to, no judge is going to take that sentence, this was done without input, as the lawyer who is asserting that has had their client requested multiple times for input and just didn't give any. Any judge who reads that is going to take that as the, the, the client wasn't even given the chance to provide input. Anyway, um, she emailed me back stating that he should have contact. What? Let's take a look at this email. I responded that I hadn't enrolled him yet, but that in my motion to modify, I further state that I indeed enrolled him. And I paid the $225 enrollment fee. No other emails have been sent. It's weird that she is saying this because I've attached three different exhibits to my motion. So for her to assert this, she needs to actually attack the, the emails that I have put in my motion. If she doesn't do that, then it's again, it's a weird sort of game of hide the ball. Because she's not saying that I lied, but she's not saying that I told the truth either. She's just kind of presenting an alternative narrative. Um, she's, of course, we have some emails from her, so I'm going to go ahead and take a look at those and see if those provide any insight. You know, there's something else that I should mention about this. It seemed to me at the hearing, because this does eventually go to a hearing and I do eventually win, but it does seem to me that the judge was actually duped by this um, sort of narrative throughout the entirety of the hearing, because throughout the entirety of the hearing, he had a really bad attitude towards my position. Then he went back into chambers with both attorneys and he came out and it was like he was completely changed. And I think at that time when he went back into chambers, it actually dawned on him that he was duped into believing a lie the whole time because it's like he kind of turned on his, he turned on a dime and he went from being really upset with me to saying that, well, basically he was upset with my ex. So it was like he had been deceived the whole time and he couldn't figure it out on his own. I think judges who really don't understand that attorneys are going to... Attorneys are paid to win, so that kind of entails tricking them sometimes. If a judge doesn't understand that, they're going to constantly make mistakes. I talked about this in one of my videos. 
um, where he analyzed two different types of judges. One type of judge who understands the role of an attorney is to win at all costs, and the other type of judge who thinks that attorneys are sort of like a judge before the judge. And those are the ones that end up falling for this stuff. Anyway, moving on. Next paragraph. I claim that I emailed her, notifying her that I had placed him in the selection process at Desert Montessori and Coral, but the email sent to her, uh, as shown in my Exhibit 3, was actually sent on January 4th and only states there is a parent orientation I'm going to on January 13th to get him into the charter school. Coral Academy is not mentioned in this email. Okay, so she's, uh, she's again, she's trying to say that that still doesn't, uh, that doesn't help because... If a person is being approached with possible schools, that invites them to discuss what school do they want the child to go to. So she's doing the best she can as an attorney. I think she knows her client's screwed up and she kind of has to nitpick at different things. But she's trying to say that this email that I sent doesn't count because in that specific email, I don't mention Coral Academy by name. Again, this is the type of stuff that they have to do sometimes when they have a bad client to put into a corner and they have to do the best they can. Argument. <clears throat> so I'm agreeing... No, so she's agreeing that modification of timeshare is necessary, but proposes a different modification. Uh, she's requesting a modification, uh, modification, she's, okay, so she's mentioning the one that I wanted, which is to close the gap, the midnight exchange gap. She doesn't oppose a change, but she requests a different plan instead. So it looks like Sunday at midnight to Wednesday at three, I can't believe she's even asking for that. Wait, she does it again. We're looking at, we're looking at two midnight exchanges again. This, I can't be reading this right. So Sunday, 12.30 to Wednesday, 3, and with her. And then Wednesday, 3 to Thursday, 7.30 a.m. with me. Then Thursday, 7.30 a.m. to Thursday, 3 with her. And then Thursday, 3 to Sunday, midnight. Oh, no, so that's just one midnight exchange. So she does want to preserve this midnight exchange, but she just wants to move the gap from the midnight in the middle of the week to 7.30 a.m. the next day. Um, this does, the judge doesn't buy this. He ends up ordering the timeshare that I proposed. Under the current plan, she has the child 101 hours per month. Okay, so this is also forbidden. The Supreme Court of Nevada says you're not really supposed to count hours. So she shouldn't even be doing this. They talk about this in Rivero v. Rivero 2009. Um, so she's, again, she's computing hours based. Ugh, she can't do this. So this is, this is a completely wrong. If anyone wants to take a look at why my ex's attorney... What, if anyone wants to see why what she's doing is wrong, just read the case, Rivero v. Rivero, 2009, and they specifically mention that you're forbidden from counting specific hours. They don't want you to break down the days to such a granular level because it just invites, um, uh, I guess you could say argumentative or inane sort of bickering over the timeshare schedule, which is exactly what the Supreme Court doesn't want. They want it to be at least at the level of the day, and you break it down by days, not hours, to avoid this kind of nitpicking. So I'm not even going to read this because it's it's in violation of existing case law. Um, the next section here is the school choice um, joint decision. What is she talking about? We failed to make a decision. This encourages the parents to share the rights and responsibilities. Okay, so she's oh, this is this is exactly what causes my ex to lose everything. This attitude. So it's like the attorney won't let go of this uh, ideal principle. Yes, ideally, parents work together and make decisions jointly, but that's just ideal. The situation in this case is not ideal. So she's basically saying, since we should be able to make a decision together, the court should force us to make a decision together. This is, again, in violation of Rivera 2009. In Rivera 2009, the Supreme Court of Nevada has stated, when two parents cannot agree, the court comes and makes a decision for the parents. The court doesn't just send the parents back to try and make a decision that they've already failed to make for the past several months slash years. So this is also in a name proposal. Usually this lawyer puts together better documents. This one's one of the worst ones she's put together so far. Uh, joint legal custody requires that we cooperate, communicate, etc. Again, this case is being used incorrectly. So this citation to Rivero v. Rivero is true, but the way that this, this attorney is using it is wrong. If parents cannot cooperate, the court needs to deprive the parent that is not cooperative of, of legal custody. Now, I do eventually use this case correctly, way down the line. I do eventually cite this case the same exact way that my ex's attorney has, but I use it the correct way, which is to tell the court, we're supposed to agree, and since we can't agree, then I should be given sole legal custody. So she's what she's doing is sort of contorting the purpose behind the case law into a meaning that it wasn't originally intended for. Next, we have legal custody involves basic legal responsibility for a child and making major decisions. Again, this is true, but it's being used incorrectly. Next, she asserts that joint legal custodians have 
uh, legal access, have uh, equal access to school records and the right to consult. Um, I'm not sure why she's, it's almost like she's just kind of reciting the case, but why? Let's take a look at the next assertion. The entire premise of joint legal is for the child to have the benefit of both parents' knowledge. Yeah, but that's the purpose. Just because it's the purpose doesn't mean that that's what it's going to come down to in every single case. This case that she's citing acknowledges that it's not always possible, but she's reading the case in a way as if to twist the court's arm into saying, this is the only thing we can do. No, the case is saying that this is the ideal way that it's supposed to happen, and that if it can't happen, then the court needs to take action. It's not saying you need to force parents to make decisions together. That doesn't work. Next assertion is that my ex would like him to attend Roland D. Melton Elementary School. This is a public school. And uh, she's opposing my choice of Coral Academy due to its location in an area of multiple... What? How is that their fault? How is that going to impact the education? So again, this is another inane... Uh, just because a bunch... I'm not even going to read it any further. Moving on. Um, she opposes Coral Academy due to its consistently lower test scores. Now, that's not true. I actually deal with this on reply by providing a, a ranking. So you're going to see how I address this assertion. This is actually a good assertion if it was true, but it's not. It's false. Um, <clears throat> the court should award attorney fees defendant. I think this is the fourth time she's asked for attorney fees. Let's see if she actually used the correct law this time. 125.040, nope, that's wrong. Leeming v. Leeming, nope, that's wrong. NRS 18.010, okay, that's correct. Uh, two o okay, so 020 is wrong, 050 is wrong, 110 is wrong. So all of these laws and cases that she cited are wrong, except for this one right here. 18.010. This law does allow for an award of attorney fees under only one subsection. I think it's subsection 2B. Yeah. Off the top of my head, I can't remember now. I think it's 18.0102B that allows for an award of attorney fees only if she has to do two things. First, she has to prevail, and then she has to show that I filed the motion to harass her. That's the hard part right there. Now, I don't want get people to get too excited because in 2015, I believe, the legislature passed a new statute that makes it a whole lot easier for attorneys like this to get attorney fee awards. So back in my day when I was dealing with this, it was easy for me to defeat these attacks. But nowadays, it's a lot trickier because of the legislature's creation of a new statute. I talk about the way that I approached this before in the video, Defend Against Attorney Fees. And I talk about the problem that the legislature has created now in the video, Attorney Fee Equalizers. Definitely watch those two videos because you can see sort of how easy it was to deal with this problem before and how much harder it is to deal with it now. And it also, I hope, puts, uh, puts into perspective how much damage a legislature can do if they don't pay attention to little details like high conflict child custody cases. Um, in addition to these factors, the Nevada Supreme Court indicated that uh, family law matters. The court must evaluate a request for attorney fees upon the factors. Are, okay, this is wrong too. So Brunsell v. Wright is not a case that talks about the entitlement to attorney fees. It only talks about the amount of the attorney fees that a court can award. So that's definitely going to be confusing for this judge if he doesn't understand this. Um, I do know, actually, that he denies her request. Um, so this is, I believe, the fourth time she's requested attorney fees, and she is going to be denied. Um, but anyway, Brunzel will be right. They're called the Brunzel factors, and they talk about how the court needs to go about computing the attorney fee award, not about whether or not the party is entitled to attorney fees in the first place. In the instant case, I filed my motion without providing any opportunity for, for us to confer. That's a lie. I sent three emails. And without notifying the lawyer, that's what? That's not even required. Okay, so again, she's kind of just inventing her own authority out of thin air. This is not at all relevant. In one of our counties, it actually partially is, but not the way that she's characterizing it. In Clark County, which is District 8, they have a local rule that requires parties to meet and confer. No, not to meet and confer. Um, to attempt resolution, that's the language. It requires parties to attempt resolution before filing something in court. It's only District 8 that requires that to my knowledge. I don't think that um, any other district in the state requires you to attempt resolution prior to filing. I have mentioned in previous videos that it is a very good thing to do, even if it's not required of you. At least try to work something out, because even if it's not required by a court rule, it could be taken into consideration by a judge later on when they're determining whether or not to sanction you and by how much they want to sanction you. So. Even though it's not required, I still recommend that you do attempt to um, re resolve a matter before filing something. Also, please take a look at my video, Requirement to Attempt Resolution. I talk about this a whole lot more in that video. And the last thing I want to mention is um, I did actually attempt this. I sent her three emails, so the attorney's not telling the truth anyway. Um, as previously noted, the defendant has always tried to cooperate with me. That's not true. Um, it is unjust to require her to oppose the motion and bear the burden of attorney fees. Actually, just because something is unjust doesn't mean that it's allowed under the law. I explain why this approach is wrong in the video. 
fairness versus the law, and I also explain it in the video, the machine. So the attorney is kind of trying to appeal to the judge's emotion. According to the defendant's request, accordingly, her request for attorney fees and costs following the hearing in this matter, um, for these reasons, she should get attorney fees. Okay, so I'm going to oppose this on reply, and it's going to get denied, so don't worry about it. Conclusion, based on the foregoing, the defendant requests the following relief. Um, she's asking for an implementation of the schedule that she's requested. She's asking for the denial of the motion regarding education and... What? Okay, I see what she's saying. She's asking for my motion to be denied, and she's asking for her schedule and her school. And then she's asking for fees and costs. Uh, declaration in support. As I mentioned in numerous videos prior, this is required by court rule. You have to verify your document, your, your motion, or, or opposition. And the reason why is because they want to make sure that everything you're asserting in this piece of paper is sworn under penalty of perjury. Certificate of mailing. This indicates to the court that she mailed this document to my address at the time. And we have the motion opposition notice, which we've gone over on a number of occasions. And this just determines whether or not you need to pay a filing fee. I believe that, uh, let's take a look here. So if she answered no to question one or two, she did answer no to question two. So then she's exempt from the filing fee. So she wouldn't have had to pay anything. Index of exhibits. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven exhibits here. And let's take a look at whether or not any of these are all. Okay, yeah, so the first one I've already gone through in the series. The second one I've already gone through in the series. Uh, the third one I've also already gone through. I actually went over this in the last video. So these first three we're going to skip over. And as I've mentioned in previous videos, if you really want to, you can go down in the description below, click on the link and download the document for yourself. Take a look. And if you have questions, go ahead and post them down below. But again, these are all documents that I've gone over already in the series anyway. So if you're following it in chronological order, you would have already seen my analysis on all of these filings. Exhibits four, five, six, and seven, we can go ahead and take a look at. So here we got exhibit one, which we are skipping. Here we have exhibit two, which we are skipping. Exhibit three, which we are skipping. And exhibit four. And this is an email, so let's take a look here. She says, so what exactly do you mean by got into? This is weird. When somebody says the child got into school, that means the child was accepted into the school. So she's trying to play dumb here. She's trying to act like she doesn't know what I'm talking about. Um, they do a lottery thing to see if he can even enroll. He isn't enrolled yet. This creates a possibility, but it doesn't mandate anything. Um, this is true. So Coral Academy is a um, charter school. So what they do is they have a little lottery. And if you get selected, then you have the opportunity to enroll, but it doesn't automatically enroll you. I uh, should have talked to her first before enrolling him, just like she notifies me about doctor's appointments. This isn't joint parenting. I did talk to her on numerous occasions, so she's forgetting about the other emails. And actually, because he hasn't been enrolled yet, it actually is just letting her know about an opportunity. So is she saying that I enrolled her? So I, Okay, so this is confusing because she asked me what I'm talking about. I tell her that he, he has an opportunity to enter, but that he's not entered yet. And then here she says that basically I did enroll him. Um, let's see if we got anything else here. He got into Coral Academy as a charter school. Please look it up. Tell me if you approve or oppose. Advise within seven days or if more time is needed, ask for more time. This is not to threaten or pressure. I'm even putting all these disclaimers in here. And she still goes ballistic. I'm going to just move on. Um, exhibit five. <clears throat> okay, so she says she knows. Again, I'm going to try to pinpoint the school stuff here. Uh, do, 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 where's the school stuff? Parent orientation. Okay, so she just reiterated the email that I already sent her. I don't see anything here about school at all, so I'm going to move past this one. Nothing here about school either. Okay, let's take a look at Exhibit 6. So she's providing... Oh, this is the list of offenders that she's talking about, that there's 19 offenders within a half mile of the school. Who cares? The judge doesn't care. It's totally unfair to judge a school on that. They can't choose where these people live. Exhibit 7. Um... Here we go. So she's circling the school comparison thing. Okay, so this is the county thing, though. Oh, this is what she's pointing out. She's pointing out the violence-related incidents. This isn't even the right school. So this actually comes out in the hearing, and I actually get an affidavit from the principal about this. The actual amount of violence at the school is zero, zero, and zero. What she did was she pulled numbers from the high school. 
So she's pulling numbers from the high school and she's trying to make it look like the elementary school is a violent place, which is completely disingenuous. And when the principal finds out about this, he gets kind of pissed off. But it's just, it's just what you have to deal with. And these stand, all of this stuff here, this is all internal to the county. This is not a very good a metric. There is um, another thing that I bring to the court. I believe it's a Washington Post ranking system, which is much more unbiased and neutral. And that's the one that the judge actually goes with once he reads that. Um, it actually, this school at the time was second place in the entire state, not just in, in our county, in the entire state it was the second best school, according to the Washington Post. So the, she just she just picks and chooses the numbers that make her look good. And I guess that's kind of what, you know, the, the court process is all about. Each side has their evidence, the court looks at both pieces and chooses the one that's more credible. And that's what the judge does. He takes hers, he rejects it, he takes mine, he accepts it, and he orders him to go to coral. So there is going to be a happy ending at the end of this, but it's just really... It's surprising the amount of fighting with so little communication to all of a sudden activate all of this sort of opposition right when I file my motion. Okay, same thing. These are the same rankings. She's so this is just the same stuff. I didn't file any of these documents, so I incurred zero dollars in costs. Um, my ex filed the opposition, but it was a free filing, so she incurred zero dollars in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. My ex's attorney did put together a pretty substantial document. Um, it wasn't the most detailed yet. We will see a few of those. Um, but it also would have included quite a bit of communication with my ex because there were several emails that she attached to it as exhibits. And she would have needed to get a lot of the details behind the back and forth on, you know, which school we were going to get our son into. So I do think two hours is a reasonable amount of time that her attorney would have put into that. It might have been a little bit less, but I don't think it's likely. And so for those reasons, at the rate of $250 an hour, my ex's attorney fees would have been $500. As for my previous videos, if you have any questions, feel free to post them down in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.